phase came from humble beginnings, just kids across America hitting trick shots and uploading them onto YouTube. But fast forward a couple years and things would go to the moon for FaZe, wealthy businessmen wanting to invest in FaZe as they saw the potential in the brand, bringing them millions of dollars, buying them entire esports teams, and giving them the funds to progress like no other esports team in the world has. Slowly, FaZe were becoming known as one of the biggest gaming organizations in the world and having a value of $1 billion. However, this didn't last long, as not even a year after becoming a public company on the stock exchange, FaZe fired their CEO, laid off 40% of their staff, and with their share price going as low as 15 cents, FaZe went to an extreme low no one had ever seen before in the esports industry. It seemed like many evil businessmen working in the shadows of the corporation had in fact taken FaZe from the youth, and tried squeezing every last dollar out of the company that they could. But the founders didn't give up, and fought to get their phase back, leading to a revolution so they can return to their roots, leading to changes many fans didn't want to accept, however it was all necessary for the future of phase. So here is the rise, fall and rise again of phase. FaZe made its debut on YouTube on the 30th of May in 2010, after they uploaded their first video titled FaZe Sniping Intro, which basically marked what FaZe was going to be, a sniping Call of Duty clan. But in Call of Duty, as most of you will know, the term sniping has a completely different meaning. In real world combat, the sniper is usually hundreds of kilometers away, taking advantage of their high power and accuracy weapon. Whereas in Call of Duty, sniping is more sort of running around the map, being mobile as possible, trying to get up close and personal. Now the reason this was impressive in gaming was because snipers predominantly had very low hip fire accuracy, long ADS times and little peripheral vision. Oh, and of course, you only had one bullet, whereas everyone else in the lobby was running around with fully automatic rifles and SMGs. But that wasn't all, as the most prestigious snipers would also do something called trick shotting, the art of creatively killing somebody with a sniper rifle by using several methods such as equipment cancelling, weapon switching, and silent shotting while spinning in a circle hoping to get a kill cam clip. What made this all even more impressive is that these guys were doing it all on controller, which is much more difficult than a keyboard and mouse. At this point, in time, the group consisted of and was founded by three players, Eric Clips Rivera, Jeff Housecat Eamon and Ben Resistance Christensen. From that point onwards, the trio would continue building their brand by firstly creating the Phase Ilcam series, which as they stated themselves was just a series that we're going to start where we show some of the sick kill cams we get in public matches. Also, all of our kill cams will be legit, so no hacks. The group would also either post full videos of flawless matches or impressive individual clips that they got. Now what Phase were doing at this point in time wasn't necessarily innovative or original. Gaming organizations existed many years before their first upload and trick shotting was a thing since the 2005 released Call of Duty 2. But what FaZe had was the swag, they had the cool intros, the trendy montage music, the best clips and would soon sign the best players. Things would really start taking off for FaZe after their first two signings, Temper and Fakey. In the current day, FaZe Temper's introduction video sits at a whopping 1.6 million views, with Fakey's also having an astonishing 2.6 million, which compares to other members introduction videos which sit at a million. 50k, it was clear these two were the big dogs that were going to elevate FaZe's popularity. 11 months forward from their first upload in the April of 2011, FaZe Clan would reach their first big milestone as they hit 100,000 subscribers on their YouTube channel. Now back in the day, this was an impressive milestone. Especially as back in 2011, the gaming world was significantly smaller and just social media in general was much more niche. It's not like in 2024 we have streamers constantly clip farming or these short form content pages or brain rock kids Roblox channels pumping out videos every day. Anyways, the majority of FaZe's success was coming from Temper and Fakey, as their videos were always the highest viewed. Temper would upload a setup tour on the channel which amassed over 1 million views, which really was nothing compared to his how to temper shot tutorial, sitting on over 6 million views in the current day, in which he taught his viewers how to replicate his own signature trick shot. But FaZe kept growing. It seemed like every week they kept on signing more and more players to fulfill their dreams of being the most recognized Call of Duty sniping clan, which they would soon achieve, as just a month before the release of Black Ops 2 in the November of 2012, FaZe clan would hit the gigantic 1 million subscriber milestone. Now the release of Black Ops 2 was important for FaZe, as it was at this point in time 
time when they would solidify themselves as the biggest gaming organisation. For example, Face Pamali would upload the first Black Ops 2 sniping montage, which now sits on 7.8 million views, which would then be followed up with FaZe Apex hitting the first Black Ops 2 trickshot kill cam. Simply, no one could replicate what FaZe was doing or the numbers that they were pulling. They were slowly but surely taking over the gaming scene, but to really cement themselves as a brand, they began expanding beyond just posting clips and montages online. They launched their own merch store, started linking up in real life and recording vlogs. For example, the MLG Anaheim event in 2013, where around a dozen of the FaZe members linked up, wearing their FaZe Clan jerseys with fans constantly coming up to them, asking for pictures and signatures. At this point, FaZe was no longer just some internet clan. They had impact on real people's lives. Now, FaZe saw that this lifestyle content was extremely beneficial as it allowed their viewers to see them more as than just the guys behind a screen hitting trick shots. These were real life people with personalities. So to continue building their brand outside of Call of Duty, CEO Thomas Temper Oliveira and COO Richard Banks Bankston created the first FaZe house in 2014 in Plainview, New York, where they could incorporate lifestyle content with their gaming content. This house consisted of the members FaZe Apex, Rain, Blaziken, Adapt, Tico, Banks and Temper, who said himself that the house changed everything for them. Temper said, Everyone made videos each day, every single day. We were creating content all together, helping everyone out. One of the best ways you can grow your brand online is to collaborate with people so you can share your ideas and share your viewers. The lifestyle content was really what allowed Face to grow as a brand, simply because on camera, these guys were acting just like any other young guy, sitting inside and playing Call of Duty all day. Apart from the fact that these guys had the status, the sponsors, the big houses and the cool cars, they were living every young guy's dream with them even being given the title, the rock stars of gaming. However, the issue was FaZe was run by literal kids, and I quote, an organization with no organization. So think about it, right now these kids are basically freestyling one of the biggest gaming clans on the internet. So just imagine how far they can take this establishment with proper planning and investments. Well, enter Hubrick, a social media platform run by Norwegian entrepreneur, Sebastian Gertz. In 2015, Gertz wanted to get involved in the gaming space as he saw potential in the scene due to the quick growth. Gertz was advised to reach out to two particular personalities. One was Chris Puckett, a notable esports commentator. The other was FaZe Temper. Gertz would personally fly out Temper to Norway so they can discuss the future of FaZe, where Temper said that they quickly formed a strong bond and added that Gertz is one of the hungriest people he had ever met, making the future of FaZe very promising. After meeting Temper, it seemed like Gertz saw the movement FaZe Clan were creating, which convinced him to invest. Kubrick helped FaZe organise its network and gave it the resources it needed to both recruit top eSport players and assist the growth of its vlog channels. Among other investments, Gertz and his partners provided the capital FaZe needed to expand beyond just Call of Duty to become an established gaming organisation. This led to them buying the most expensive Counter-Strike team in the world, which it put together by acquiring the lineup of eSports collective G2 for a reported $700,000 dollars, where they got a quick return on their investment. As shortly after being signed, the team achieved its first piece of silverware after winning the 2017 E-League CSGO Premier alongside a $500,000 reward price. Alongside giving them investment funds, Hubrick also brought professional management to oversee the newly structured phase organization. Lee Trink, the former president of Virgin Records America, would be assigned as the new CEO of FaZe, with him previously working with major music stars like Katy Perry, Kid Rock, and 30 Seconds to Mars. But really, this was just a beginning. I mean, this is 2015. Gaming was nowhere near the size that it is today. As Lee Trink stated himself after joining FaZe in 2015, we've only just scratched the surface. The buzz around esports is disproportionately large compared to the money. I think we're in the first inning of esports as an economic powerhouse in sports. To round off 2017, just shortly after hitting 4 million subscribers on the main FaZe Clan YouTube channel, on the 17th of December in 2016, they would announced a brand new LA phase house, which also meant they were abandoning their previous New York house. But it was definitely worth it, as they moved out from their family's suburban home into a mini mansion with fountains and an elevator in LA. Fans saw this era as the peak of phase, as from reading the comments of their announcement video, we can see people saying things such as, this was literally the peak of YouTube, everything was so awesome back when this video dropped. My favourite time on YouTube, I'd wait to see their new videos on all of their channels, it was so awesome. And to really 
realize how ahead of every other gaming organization they were, fans even left comments making fun of rival clans. Optic feels sick to their stomach watching this. To put it simple, FaZe were eating good, so rather than fulfilling the cliche gamer stereotype of sitting in your mum's basement with no money, they lived it more like rappers or celebrities, which can be seen in his video FaZe Rain uploaded around this period, showing off his brand new McLaren 57S with a price tag of around $190,000. But unfortunately, as money started coming into the picture, you could say FaZe began slowly losing their identity as it was stepping further and further away from their game roots and becoming more lifestyle focused, which may seem contradicting to what I said previously in the video, but in the past, FaZe were mostly gaming focused with a sprinkle of vlogs here and there to build a relationship with their viewers, but as their clout and money increased, it seemed like their love for gaming was no more. A member of FaZe that went in this particular direction will be FaZe Banks, it seemed like gaming was no longer an interest of his, so he decided to move to LA in 2017 into the clout house with fellow content creators right Gum and Alyssa Violet, together as a trio forming the Clout Gang, where they pivoted into different forms of content, ranging from challenges to getting into petty beefs, if that even counts as content. With each upload, Banks was separating himself more and more from gaming, whether it be showing off his new house, spending 24 hours in an elevator with Rice Gum, or hanging out with rappers that pull up to his street, it really seemed like their interest in gaming was no more, and that could be said the same about the main FaZe Clan channel. Yet they were still uploading Call of Duty videos, however, what was doing well was the personality content and lifestyle content. For example, when they played Call of Duty with Lil Yachty, who in that year was one of the hottest rappers out. Or when they were doing random in real life videos such as mystery ping pong or lie detector tests. Now, whether you call this diversifying your content or losing the love for gaming you once had, it was clear the OGs of FaZe were trying to head into a different direction. Now, as we're moving into 2018, it seemed like FaZe were trying to expand as an organization way too fast without carefully thinking about what they were actually doing, which came with its costs. With Fortnite slowly taking over the world at this point in time, it seemed like FaZe saw this as a huge opportunity to grow, making hundreds of videos surrounding Fortnite and also signing many players, with one of these being Tfue with him being one of the biggest streamers during the rise of Fortnite. However, this big arrival ended up becoming one of FaZe's biggest controversies as in the May of 2019, Tfue would file two lawsuits against FaZe, alleging the company was exploiting him with an oppressive, onerous and one-sided contract that violated state law and the Talent Agency Act. He claimed his contract with FaZe allowed the organization to collect up to 80% of revenue he earned from third parties and prevented him from from signing lucrative sponsorship deals. They also claimed Tfue was pressured into drinking and gambling even though he was under 21 years old. Now of course, this situation went insanely viral as we had the biggest Twitch streamer at the time going to war with the biggest gaming organization. This would lead to FaZe Banks releasing a response video titled Dear Tifu, where Banks addressed the fact that he thought Tifu was his brother and had no idea he would do this to him. First off, I just want to say I don't agree with what him and his team have done. I think it's complete and utter. Most of it is a complete lie, exaggerated, and it's tactical, which you don't use tactics and legal strategy against friends. Because I thought before anything else, before the business, before anything like that, before egos, before views, before all that, honestly, I thought we were friends. Tifu, I called you my family. Banks would also address that they only made $60,000 from Tifu, which was nothing compared to the money he was making from competitive earnings at YouTube and Twitch. He would also address the pressuring to drink allegations where he would explain that Tifu can be seen multiple times in videos drinking by himself. Turner was also pressured into drinking underage. Homie, that is so f***ing bullshit. No, and everybody who was at those parties knows it. Tifa would clap back with his iconic release the contract video where he would simply explain how absurd his contract was and that FaZe are ripping off many other content creators with these types of contracts. These contracts are not okay and this needs to never happen again. And there's tons of people in contracts this bad just like me. And I'm the first person to stand up and say this is, f this is not right, this is not cool, this is f***ing bullshit. 
However, just three months later, FaZe fired back with a countersuit filed with the Southern District of New York. It claimed Tifu disparaged the team in violation of a clause in his agreement, stole its confidential information, and interfered with other business contracts and relationships. FaZe asserted the play had earned upwards of 20 million since joining in April 2018, thanks to its unique methods of helping him create and promote content, and that it had only collected upwards of $60,000 of his deals. They also claimed that all of this was leading up to Tifu starting his own eSport organization, which again was against his contract. Now, Face Seabass would actually release a video about Tifu's contract where he admitted that Tifu's contract wasn't the best and that Face had offered him a new contract multiple times as they valued a healthy relationship with all of their members. However, even though they tried to renegotiate with him multiple times, Tifu wasn't very communicative and would sometimes simply not respond. Now, whatever the outcome, Outcome the situation would end in, it was not a great look for FaZe and its potential future signees. Having so much negative publicity with your biggest star is not a great look when you're trying to grow your organization into the mainstream, especially as it was around this time FaZe would open its Series A funding round, which is the name typically given to a company's first significant round of venture capital financing, basically allowing rich people to give them money. So through 2019, a whole bunch of celebrities would invest in FaZe, musicians, such as Pitbull, Yo Gotti and Offset, basketball players such as Myers Leonard, Josh Hart and Jamal Murray, or entrepreneurs such as Jimmy Levine, who is a CEO of Interscope Records which is known as one of the biggest labels in the world. This Series A funding led to a gain of $40 million which will support expansion, player acquisition and operations. In 2020, FaZe would continue receiving more investment as it would receive a $22.7 million loan from a private lender. By the end of 2020, FaZe Clan was announced by Forbes to be the fourth most valuable esports team in the world, with a value of $305 million and an estimated revenue of $40 million. But even with these impressive numbers, it couldn't stop the lack of satisfaction Faction or disconnection FaZe was feeling with its viewers. For example, every signing they made made it seem like it wasn't about the actual player but the headlines they could get from it. For example, FaZe High Sky, who was signed to FaZe so he can be known as the youngest FaZe member, felt kind of pointless and almost seemed like it was just so they can appeal to a younger audience so they can think, oh, this can be you one day. And this signing in general would go terribly south anyways as FaZe High Sky would be exposed for being 12 years old, leading to his Twitch account being banned and FaZe having more controversy as there was rumours that they made him lie about his age. It seemed that the FaZe recruits no longer meant anything and that FaZe was signing anyone and everyone just so they can have the FaZe name plastered everywhere. Their rosters were so bloated, filled with a bunch of people no one even knew or cared about. I mean, no offence to Bronny, I know he's LeBron James' son and pulled up to the Cloud House a couple times, but why is he signed to FaZe? Or why in the hell is Snoop Dogg a part of the board of directors for FaZe? I guess you could look at it from two ways, it was good marketing strategies or poor signings. Another problem with FaZe was the content. With their new $30 million FaZe mansion, they recorded a reveal video, in which it felt less and less like FaZe and more like a reality TV show, or maybe even a Jake Paul Team 10 video. And this trend would follow all of them, as the biggest FaZe Clan members stopped really making gaming videos and instead made clickbaity real life content that would get them views. Now as we move into 2021, it would be announced that FaZe Clan would be merging with special purpose acquisition company B. Riot to become a public company listed on Nasdaq, which is one of the three most followed stock market indices in the United States. The initial valuation of FaZe after this merge would be a staggering $1 billion. As part of this merge, FaZe would receive $291 million from B. Riley and will be renamed to FaZe Holdings Inc. and refocus itself as a brand for the voice of youth culture. The newly named FaZe Holdings ended up going public on the 20th of July 2022, however, with a lower than announced valuation of $725 million. But you see, going through a SPAC is seen as a controversial method, as your company isn't going public by itself, you're being mixed in with another company, which almost acts as a shell so it has the foundations to go public which was an issue as it meant any old businessman was given the keys to FaZe. 
with these people really having no idea what FaZe was or what they stood by, which would tarnish and dilute FaZe's image and influence as they would mostly be concerned only about the financial side of things. Nevertheless, this was still an incredibly impressive achievement and the future for FaZe seems bright. However, soon after going public, the FaZe esports empire would start crumbling down. In 2021, a handful of FaZe members would participate in something called a Save the Kids token. Nikon, K, Tico and Jarvis would all put out a tweet announcing this brand new project they will be working on. Now this was of course a pump and dump and if you didn't know what that is, it's when fraudsters typically spread false or misleading information to create a buying frenzy that will pump up the price of a stock and then dump shares of the stock by selling their own shares at an inflated price. So basically, Risegum and these phase guys were promoting this, telling everyone to buy it because this is actually a charity and a percentage of the transaction fees are going to be donated to kids in need. So their plan was buy loads of these kids tokens when it's worth nothing, promote it as a charity so people buy it and the value increases, then quickly sell it all for a fast profit. But this also meant a bunch of innocent people who thought this was genuinely a good business move or a charity were going to lose out on thousands of dollars. After its launch on the 5th of June in 2021, the price of the kids token was around 0.02 USD. Though the price of the token collapsed to less than half a cent and further declined to price the token around 0.00138 USD at the start of July 2021. According to YouTuber CoffeeZilla, the crash of Save the Kids was caused by Jarvis selling two thirds of his coins, Nikon selling one third of his holdings and K selling nearly his entire collection of tokens, predicted to be valued around $80,000. Now of course, shortly after they all sold, everyone found out it was a scam and the only person who was perceived as innocent was FaZe Tico, which was well because he bought about $40,000 worth and didn't sell any of it, meaning he lost all of his money. As all of these people apart from RiceGum were FaZeClan representatives, they had to be addressed. FaZeClan management tweeted that they were completely unaware of the actions of its members and that it did not condone such behaviour, posting that K had been expelled from the group entirely, while Jarvis, Nikon and Tico would be suspended until further notice. More issues would arise for FaZe around this period, as social media influencer and FaZe Banks' ex-girlfriend Alyssa Violet would sue FaZe Clan over promised shares in the company. Alyssa claimed in her lawsuit that back in 2018, she and many other FaZe members made a deal with FaZe to trade her shares of the company to shares in Hubrick Limited, which was working with FaZe to develop both businesses. Now later in that year, the partnership between FaZe and Hubrick dissolved, so Alyssa and many others sued Hubrick for fraud which was eventually settled as she made an oral agreement with FaZe Clan to give up her claims against Hubrick in exchange for FaZe Clan common stock. But fast forward a couple years, Alyssa still hasn't received her stock that she was allegedly promised. Alyssa's lawyer would state, FaZe Clan is being sued because it specifically promised to compensate Alyssa when it asked her to relinquish her Hubrick stock and asked her to dismiss her claims against Hubrick and others. If FaZe Clan simply abided by its promise to compensate her, Alyssa would not have had to sue FaZe Clan. But things would continue going south for FaZe. After they became a publicly traded company and opened at around $13 per share, which would even rise to almost $25 a share on the 30th of August in 2022. However, just five months later on the 26th of January in 2023, the price would plummet to 75 cents per share. Now, NASDAQ rules state that any company that fails to close above the $1 mark for 30 consecutive days days is issued a deficiency notice which can trigger a delisting, meaning once notified, FaZe had 180 calendar days to return to compliance, meaning it must close a $1 price for 10 consecutive days. This would basically lead to FaZe going full sellout mode to try keep their company from getting delisted. Just a day after their stock price dropped to 75 cents, they would announce a shoe collaboration with Nike. They would also abandon one of the biggest esports rivalries and collaborate with Optic and would even announce a new partnership with Porsche. In the February of 2023, FaZe Clan laid off 20% of its staff, which according to their CEO Trink was a result of the uncertainty of the economy. But in reality, it was because FaZe was trying to save themselves. 
Trink would continue trying to dispute the public agenda that FaZe is failing, by ensuring that FaZe will focus on financial discipline and by reporting that the revenue growth for 2022 was a 25% increase from 2021. However, these comments only had the people fooled for so long, as just within the first quarters of 2023, FaZe would report a loss of approximately $14 million. This really put everyone in FaZe Clan in full panic mode. In March, FaZe had received the official notice of the listing, giving them 180 days to get the stock price back above $1, meaning time was ticking. In April, board member Snoop Dogg was kicked alongside their longtime CEO Trink, but not only was FaZe literally falling apart, it was also beginning to rot from the inside, as FaZe members and social media influencers such as Mr. Beast would start exposing the truth about FaZe. First, FaZe Tico would make a video titled Dear FaZe Clan, where he would dive deep into exposing how he was treated very poorly as a 12 year member of FaZe Clan and in general how the organization has fallen. In a way FaZe is bigger than it ever was but it's also smaller than it ever was. All of these collabs that we were doing with really really big brands, you know what it is to me? All of these collabs that's coming out, it's like band-aid or silver tape on internal bleeding. That's the way I see it. And they think talent don't matter, they think that we don't matter because they think that they can do everything because they see the FaZe logo as the Nike logo and they can just do whatever they want. But there's no depth to it. There's no substance there. There's nothing behind that FaZe logo backing it. There's no culture anymore. That's what these people don't understand. But it wasn't only Tico that was coming out and exposing FaZe, as for the past couple years, FaZe Rain has been trying to expose FaZe Clan as a business, not the people, for stealing the organization from them. Someone brings in uh, like a money guy. He wasn't even a money guy. He was a finesse guy who told him, oh, I know guys from here, here. I can help you guys do his structure, this, that. But he's just a pathological liar who will, like, I genuinely believe has like a real mental illness. Like he really can't stop lying, bro. Like it's insane. So, but he, insane. he must've got in with money though. He brought in a guy who he said he knew since he was a kid who was like royalty in Norway and then he invested a lot of money and he, that's why you know he still has what he has but that guy ended up stealing all the money essentially the other guy oh yeah had his wife on salary allegedly by the way for six hundred thousand dollars a month for his wife a lot of them like we have a glorified middleman who got more shares than like Alex and Rugg combined like why how do you come into the company and be a glorified middleman all he does is pass information for Lee and he gets more shares than Alex and Rugg how yeah in what world why do these boomers just to walk in and take more shares than the dudes that built it and let's just be realistic about who's more valuable like who can be replaceable we could swap out every day and nobody would notice we can't swap out alex and rug every day and nobody would that's not how it works no, they're the ones with the leverage but the way that they did is they came in set up their flag start bringing people in so throughout this video all those investors i've been mentioning more specifically the old ceo lee trink have basically been slowly trying to take over phase think about it they came in in 2015 when they were all kids promising to give them an investment so they can make it big. But fast forward a couple years and the founding members have been isolated from the company and replaced by a bunch of granddad executives. It now makes so much sense why FaZe over the years lost so much of its identity and became such sellouts. All these deals with Porsche, Nike and other big brands, most of the FaZe members didn't even know this stuff was being signed until they saw it on their timelines. FaZe was literally taken from the youth. But also like our old CEO kind of got in between us also. He like kind of turned us all against each other. He was really weird and crazy. Like I'm saying full blown manipulate. Like come to me. Banks said this about you. Apex said this about you. But you're this. And then he'd go to banks. And Norton said this about you. And Apex said this about Jesus you. Jesus Christ. He's a monster. He's an absolute monster. That's you guys all mean. agree to that? Unanimously. There's not a single human in phase that would ever say he is anything less than a monster. The corporate phase people would even try to put out a tweet trying to calm the storm. We know that for too long we haven't been the phase we need to be, but we're working hard towards fixing that. We hope to have all the OGs sit down together soon and we don't want to do that without everyone. We'll do everything in our power to work this out and not let you down, but it would backfire on them as Mr. Beast, the biggest YouTuber in the world, would state, they should be the people in charge. When I visited, not a single person I met had any idea how to make a good piece of content. Content. So even Mr. Beast knows that the people currently in charge have no idea what they are doing and are slowly killing FaZe. Rain would even expose how FaZe are barely making any money from their esports roster. Ready? Let's start. DSGO, revenue 514, cost of goods and services 576, so negative things too. But we would keep CSGO because like, it's CSGO, you gotta keep CSGO. Halo Infinite, revenue 108, cost of goods 194 for a negative 86. PUBG Mobile, 
revenue 125, cost of goods 37k. That's great. PUBG Mobile makes 87k a month. I think that's like the only winner here. Rocket League 87k, but we spend 123. Rainbow Six we make 80k, but we spend 124, so negative 40. COD we spend 6k because Atlanta phase covers it. Um, PUBG, God damn, what the hell is going on in PUBG? PUBG we spend 85k a month, but only make 4k. That's crazy. Negative 82 with that. Bro, and this is the crazy part. For, for Super Smash Bros, Valorant, Apex Legends, Valorant Female, FIFA Online, Fortnite, R1, The Flank, and FIFA, we make zero dollars. Okay, 224K, 37K, 94K, 21K, 48K, 86K, 33K, and 1K. And that is a month. This is every month. We are negative $700,000 a month on esports. And they made that guy president. So after Rain and Tico protested the direction FaZe was heading in, it was time for a revolution and for the OGs to take back their FaZe. In the October of 2023, GameSquare would officially close its deal to acquire FaZe Clan, with the deal worth approximately $15.75 million that would see FaZe Clan delisted from the public stock exchange, with GameSquare's main goal being steadying the ship at FaZe Clan as the reported losses are over $50 million in 2022. So just in the span of about a year, FaZe went from being valued at $1 billion to being sold for $17 million. The truth was, it was a massive failure, which was predominantly due to the old heads in the company thinking they can just dump money and do a bunch of brand deals to grow FaZe beyond the small esports world they resided in, which is not possible. As part of a renewed focus on the brand, this deal returns FaZe to its founders. FaZe Banks, FaZe Temper and FaZe Apex were appointed to lead the brand moving forwards, where for the rest of 2023, they will try to restore FaZe to its roots by doing lots of damage control. Now fast forward to the April of 2024, FaZe was about to be reborn. The official FaZe Twitter account would tweet out Control alt delete which is a key combination that reboots a computer, which suggested FaZe Clan was going to be restarted. In this tweet, they also attached a video with a bunch of animated code, in which they announced that they are removing a large portion of their FaZe roster and only keeping a handful of members, whilst also leaving a couple spaces for new signees. Which made sense as just a couple weeks prior to this, Banks would state on the podcast how he completely wants to cut down on the phase members. We're, we're cutting all kinds of people. Yeah, okay. I mean, we're cutting. We're we're cutting the roster down significantly. We had something like 140 employees this time last year. I think we have 30 right now. I want to cut that down even further to like 10. And unfortunately, even the man that started this revolution, FaZe Rain, announced that he himself will also be leaving FaZe as it is still 51% corporate owned. And he does not want to get involved in that due to what happened in the past and with his fear that they will stab him in the back again. Just two days after the control alt delete tweet, FaZe would start slowly announcing its new signees, which was a handful of new promising streamers. First, they would announce Blackboy Max, a 20-year-old streamer from New Jersey who blew up originally from music reactions. He now streams himself hosting Discord events, recording music or reactions to random things on the internet, where a lot of the time he will get his diehard community 5-star involved, whether it be in e-dates, pack battles or getting them to send in things to react to. The day after Max's announcement, Silky would be introduced as the next phase member, who began his career streaming himself playing NBA 2K, but ended up pivoting in just chatting streams, which would mean he was doing reaction videos or e-dates on Discord. The next member to join would be Lacey, who is one of the fastest growing streamers in recent times. Coming from a background of competitive Fortnite and being renowned for doing streams of clicks, however, started delving into more personality and just chatting content. For example, doing a stream for 14 days straight where he shaved every follicle of hair on his face, but in recent times has been doing more IRL content, such as dates or a 24 hour stream with clicks. Then the final member of FaZe to be introduced is Jason the Ween, who started out doing extremely cringe TikTok videos, which then led him to take up streaming where he carried on the cringe personality, but now doing e-dates. Now those were the fresh members of FaZe, but we mustn't forget about Your Rage and Ronaldo. Now even though these two were announced prior to the new FaZe clan, they were kept on the roster as they are still at the forefront of the streaming world, he'll be playing a big part in the future of FaZe, especially Your Rage, who was given a higher power role where it was stated in his joining statement that 
your rage will also recruit creators that identify with its audience and excite phases core community to further build a collective aimed to inspire the next generation. And another member that I cannot forget to mention is FaZe Kaysan, who again played a big part in his rebrand of FaZe due to his connections in the streaming world. Now at first, this new FaZe got a lot of hate. You dropped the roster, bud. I think you also dropped the ball. As a long time FaZe Clan supporter, I understand the idea of wanting to bring back the old times, but kicking the old players from the team seems a little counterproductive to what your vision is. Now a lot of fans had this opinion, but the truth is FaZe had to innovate. Many of the OG members are now 30 years old and our families all are into other ventures. And with streaming now being the face of content creation on the internet, it was smart from FaZe to recruit a group of people just like AMP or Sidemen, who can grow a strong bond between themselves and work together slowly to become some of the biggest streamers in the world. I mean, they kind of already are, as when they're all live they put extremely good numbers which will only continue to grow. FaZe Banks would even clap back to everyone hating on the new FaZe. Who remembers two months ago when everyone was spamming me, who the F are these people? You're ruining FaZe, you're an idiot. Do you guys miss the non-stop revolving door of brand deals and disingenuous merch drops? Do you guys miss the version of FaZe when we're all depressed and corporate bozos are extracting the maximum amount of money they can from us and you? Yeah, sorry, but honestly, F the old FaZe. With all due respect, we aren't doing shit for other people anymore, we're doing it for ourselves. What we think is fun. What we think is cool. Been proving people wrong my entire career, this will be no different. With love, always. This group already have their own face house in Miami, where they will of course do their own stuff, but majority of the time, will always join in together and will often do huge IRL streams. For example, all of them right now have headed to Japan. The new phase is operating under the at phase YouTube channel with their blue reboot branding, where they're already pulling extremely impressive numbers. I think something that is important to mention is that none of these guys are signed to contact contracts or have any financial incentive to be in phase. This new phase is just a group of friends making content and enjoying the journey, just like back in 2015. So that is the rise, fall and rise again of phase clan. Hope you guys enjoyed, like, subscribe and comment and I'll see you guys in the next one.